Hi, and welcome to the Red Hat Podcast. And my name is Harish Pillay, and I'm glad to have today Bill Wright, a four-year veteran in Red Hat. He has been with Red Hat's telco business unit for a while, and right now he is focused on the AI strategy for global industries. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you here. Hey, Harish. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. So, Bill, when we talk about AI and ML, ML as a machine learning and AI as artificial intelligence, in my mind, has always been that AI is the overarching big picture and ML is a one of those streams of consciousness, as it were, under AI. Is that a right way to frame it, uh, AI as the big picture and ML as just one pillar? Yeah, I, I guess you could look at it that way. And then you could take it a step further and get into deep learning as well, which is where some of the more advanced work is taking place today. But you're absolutely correct. That is a good stepped way to, to define it. Yeah, because I think one of the challenges a lot of people have is when they say, oh, my system has AI or my organization is introducing AI. They're not being specific ex to exactly what is it that they are going to be doing or getting out of it. So if someone were to ask, hey, Bill, can you tell me something about AI? Where would you actually start a conversation and how would you go about guiding somebody in, along that line? Yeah, there, there are a lot of different ways you could look at it. You know, I mean, you know, ML refers to an AI system that can self-learn based on whatever algorithm or intelligence is being applied. And uh, a system that basically accumulates knowledge over time uh, on its own, basically autonomously, would be considered a form of machine learning. Deep learning is, is, I guess there are a lot of different ways to define that, but it's you know, normally applied to large data sets. And I would say as well, you know, it's funny because small data sets now are becoming the vogue in a lot of the research that's taking place out there, enabling a uh, AI, I guess you could say intelligence, to be able to reach a conclusion quickly based on smaller inputs. And so there are a lot of different areas of research right now, but um, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. It's a fascinating field of study right now because there's so much work and so much investment being put into it. It's interesting that you said the small data set type of activities. How would we, because one of the challenges uh, that I've noticed over the years is that, you know, uh, people, researchers were saying we need very large corpus of data in order for us to do any form of analysis. So how would that gel with what you just mentioned, smaller data sets for uh, machine learning? How does that work? And, and you know, it's funny, maybe I misspoke. It would be smaller data inputs or uh, it, it would be based on prior information and prior assimilation and determinations on data and be, oh, okay. being able to kind of create a lattice work, you could say, of logic where you don't have to constantly recompute the entire absolute end-to-end -end data set over and over again. You really begin a shorthand, almost the way the human mind works, of individual, like, uh, I guess, conclusions that have been reached over your lifetime that you apply very quickly to individual situations that may come in at a smaller scale. So, for example, if you're driving in the rain, and let's say you you begin to fishtail and, you're in the, the, the end of your car begins to skid away from you. You know how when you're driving on a freeway and yep. it's a really heavy downpour? Well, based on prior knowledge, you know that if you steer in to that, to that fishtailing effect, the car will most likely, with a high degree of probability, right itself again. Because it's mm. based on pre-existing knowledge. You don't have to go through all the pain of turning away from the fish tail and <laughs> yeah. going into the ditch and all the different things yeah. you used to do. You kind of have a, a shorthand way of determining what's going to happen and you apply it instantaneously. And based on that kind of initial smaller input, you kind of know what the next logical action or answer will be. It's, it's a very rough analogy, but that's kind of the idea is based on pre-existing experiences and pre-existing data points, you don't have to go through all the training necessary to get to that basic final result. So that's in some ways, you know, the model that you start off with, the model that was trained on previous data. And based on the model, then you apply brand new streams of data coming in and assess accordingly. Correct. And you can use a smaller subset of determinations yeah. to, to reach that in some, right. in some instances as well. So it really depends. But when, a, when things are being trained initially, especially deep learning um, algorithms, it would be a different kind of um, 
totality of data, it would be a much larger framework of data to take mm -hmm. a look at. And so, yeah, at the initial stages, a lot of data generally is required, at least in today's uh, in today's state of the uh, of the technology. Um, so, Bill, you were you are looking at AI strategy for global industries from a Red Hat perspective. So, in the last say five years or you know so on, where do you see the global uh, investments in terms of VC funding or you know corporate type of uh, work being done in the AI space? I mean, looking at AI startups and all that, where do you see how do you see that panning out in the last five years, and how, where do you think that might go for in the, into the future? That's a very good question, and there are so many different areas of AI machine learning right now that people are investing in. It's fascinating. You know, it, it depends on, I guess, the area of focus and the, and the vertical of focus, so to speak. If you look at, if you look at, for example, telecommunications, predictive maintenance is a big focus area for AI and ML right now, and there are a variety of different areas where, you know, the investments are being applied. And you know, it's funny because the total amount of investment has really gone up to a record high, especially over the last five years. I think um, you know it was around maybe the three or four billion range previously, and now, like just in one quarter alone in 2019, it was like at 7.4 billion in terms of these. Oh wow! Startup, so it's really skyrocketed over the last few years. And it's funny because you know I, I kind of grew up in Silicon Valley in my career, and you learn over time. It's funny just by being here and talking to people, and you kind of get that kind of I guess environmental knowledge over time and talking to lots of different folks. You can kind of track the growth and the direction of I guess the IT industry and the software industry by the placement of investment as kind of a barometer as to what's going to happen three years out. And so when I began to see the uptick in investment in AI and machine learning, and there had been a long winter previously, you know, I guess in the yeah. 90s or something that were, there was very little at all, or I, I think it was around the 90s. So there was kind of this trough of inactivity. And then suddenly the last five years, it's begun to just spike. And so what we're beginning to see is the beginning of a technology implementation wave. That's the thing. You see the money going in, eventually customers begin to adopt it. And then boom, before you know it, it's all around, it's everywhere. The internet boom was a very similar thing. And yes, I am old enough to remember that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think we both old. are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's funny about it is um, if you kind of just use that as a barometer, you'll begin to kind of see the wave. And if you take a look at the individual technologies and companies that are invested in as well, you begin to get a sense of where those verticals within that investment wave are going to emerge. And so that's really been the idea is taking a look at all of that. But um. In different verticals, like I said, telco, that's really big. Autonomous network optimization is another big one. Uh, customer care, you know, there, there's a, I don't know if, <laughs> I was on a customer care call with a telecommunications company that will be nameless right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was completely autonomous until just about the very end. I have never gone through a customer care call like that more efficiently with an autonomous system in my life. I couldn't believe what was happening. Wow. It was like I was talking to a person. And it's a, it's still a rare occurrence for me to really be, I wasn't fooled. I knew it was a machine, but it instantly responded to everything I said. And I had never had that experience before. I was like. So it almost passed the Turing test. Uh, yeah, exactly. That five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you could tell. I mean, it had the canned voice. It had oh, okay. The, okay. Art, the artificial, you know, typing in the background, you know. <laughs> It was oh, so there was hard. artificial typing sounds as well? Exactly. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> it, it was hilarious. But but what was funny is it was very accurate. That what okay. was, To me, that was the fascinating part. It was really probably through NLP, of course, identifying those verbal cues and really acting on them effectively. It was fascinating. All right. So so you think, I mean, given the various uh, verticals that uh, you, you have been focused at uh, from uh, Red Hat's perspective, and telco being one of those, I think, given your additional background in telco, what about areas like medical healthcare? Do you see AI helping in that area? And is that an area that you're looking at from a strategy perspective? Absolutely. You know, what's interesting in that area is um, in image analysis is kind of one of the very first use cases I've seen some very heavy use of AI and ML. In. Um, I actually was lucky to run across a very small startup called Percepta Labs a couple of years ago. And I had had some interactions with Stanford's innovation program and had uh, spoken there and done some other things with them. They're really, it's a wonderful organization. And one of the professors there, Bill Cockyane, reached out to me and he said, uh, I guess, 
basically, have you guys heard of Percepta Labs? And I said, no, who are they? And he said, well, they're doing some work with us in medical research. And mm. as, the, as the exchange went on, they're basically using Percepta Labs and their AI ML framework, which is basically just building models. It's a model enablement tool. It's all right. about getting models into, into production use quickly. And they, they focus on reinforcement learning too, which is a tough thing to do from that perspective. To, from a, a drop and drag perspective, that's not, <laughs> not an easy uh, endeavor under the covers. But what was interesting about it is they were using them to figure out and discern oxygen bubbles from stem cells for harvest and cultivation. And it was really interesting because apparently they look very similar. And so mm. they were using an algorithm to, to developed and designed by Percepta Labs to go out there and basically, you know, see the differences between the two and know where to target things. And so, you know, those kinds of use cases are really interesting to me because they literally can help save lives, you know? I mean, they can really enable a much more accurate diagnosis. And there are things like medical assistance, you know, basically mm -hmm. assistance to doctors that help reach determinations on a patient's uh, potential conditions and what the variables could be. And there are so many, I mean, doctors are amazing to me. Nurses are even more amazing, but honestly, yeah. it's, it's the kind of thing where I, I look at their jobs and they have to know so many details about the human body and all the different conditions. And I got to tell you, there are days when I wake up early and I don't remember everything. <laughs> and, and so to me, it's a wonderful tool for any medical professional to lean on to basically get the absolute nth degree of potential, you know, information easily and quickly analyzed. And, and so to me, it's a great assistant. And that's where I see the intersection of AI and humanity. AI as the assistant, not as the, you know, the, the evil intelligence. Because it's so funny to me, it's... it's um, AI is a software program. That's what yeah. it is, fundamentally. Um, it, it is not, it, it's a highly advanced one. Yes, absolutely. But um, you're using software to basically make your life better. That's that's always been my objective and goal with working in AI. And in the healthcare industry, there are many different ways that AI can really help healthcare professionals make their jobs easier without taking their jobs away from them. That's the interesting thing. It's really an augmentation. Because a human and a machine together, it, it's like three times more powerful than the machine alone or the human alone. It's really interesting. That, that's right. I think you hit something uh, quite clearly on the on the head right now. Is that it's the idea of predictable AI, because you know one of the challenges that has uh, come up over the years with the the flowering of AI the opportunities and algorithms and all that is explainable AI. Uh, you know, someone can explain how does this AI actually work. Why does it do what it does? How does it come up to a, uh, why does the image is being processed? Why does this come up to, with these suggestions? What was the, the thing that the, it did that the human missed out? Is it because additional data points or something else? So the, the idea of explainable AI, I think that would be an area where, uh, you know, there will be a lot more interest from, from my perspective. And do you see, therefore, you know, the VC community doing investments in that explainable AI uh, angle? I think it's necessary because I think every industry at some level from a regulatory perspective is going to require it. I mean, either a government um, or it could be the you know, HIPAA, the healthcare industry. It could be in telecommunications, you know, all the different regulatory frameworks. You know, when you think about them across all these different industries, that alone is going to drive explainable AI. Because if you think about it, you're giving an enormous amount of power to a software program. And that software program could be enormously beneficial. But it's not only the determinations it makes based on you know, factors like bias, et cetera, but it's also if something goes haywire. If, and this isn't just telecommunications. It's banking. It's anything. Um, you know, when you think about it, if a telecommunications network begins to communicate with another one in an adjacent country, and decides to shut it down for maintenance, you know, like as a, yeah. as a mistake, you know, yeah. then boom, suddenly you, you better explain quickly where the problem lies and be able to turn it around very quickly as well. And so that, that force multiplier of both humans and machines working together, to me, is really the, the ultimate balance and symmetry of where this is all going to reside at some point. But in the interim, I think, you know, if we're going to deploy AI, the, the DIY model, completely DIY, um, you know, it, it becomes a little problematic. You know, we have to take a look at how we can create frameworks of reference, how we can create platforms like Red Hat is the Open Data Hub, which is a wonderful framework. And we're also working on something now called the Enterprise Neurosystem with a couple of key partners, including America Mobile. 
all these different areas are going to be fascinating, I think, as, as time goes forward, because, you know, it has to be explainable, but it's also going to be given a lot of responsibility. So how do we balance that? How do we navigate that? And what are the ethics around that? How do we get rid of bias? I mean, I know I'm kind of going off the deep end here very quickly. But there's there's <laughs> yeah. so many different avenues we can pursue in this uh, this topic. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's a really, really I, I, interesting field of study. Yeah, you mentioned America Mobile. Could you explain what that is supposed to be? Uh, what's what, what what is it all about? Oh well, so we uh, four years ago when I came to Red Hat, I was having a wonderful uh, conversation with Raúl Reyes, who is one of the folks in charge of their global infrastructure for the most of their uh, most of the corporation. And he's a very nice guy. He's very bright, uh, very relaxed. He's got a really wonderful way uh, about him. And we were having this conversation, and he said, "Well, Bill." what is Red Hat doing with AI and mobile networks? And I looked at him because we were friends and I said, absolutely <laughs> nothing. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah, this is four years ago. And he said, well, yeah, I think it's yeah. a good time to start looking at, because back then AI wasn't ready for prime time in my estimation for something as rigorous as a mobile network, that kind of absolute uptime, you know, it, it, there's, it's a whole different beast essentially. And so what he, went on to say was, you know, we're beginning to look at all these different ways you could apply AI in the mobile network. And we think Red Hat is very well positioned from an open source perspective to look at how this is going to evolve because open mm -hmm. source is a really nice, I guess you could say Petri dish or, or, or area where many different minds can come together and really come up with some fantastic solutions. And I said, wow. So we started a group called the AI, I guess the AI networking group. And uh, for want of a better expression, and Chris Wright, our CTO, showed up to the first few meetings. Um, we had a bunch of our top telco engineers and other folks from all over the organization come in. And over time, you know, we started our AI ILT focus group yeah. internally. So yeah. Yeah. we then began to kind of diminish the networking group, but a few of us just kept talking. It was really interesting. And so over time, as we went forward, um, what was really interesting is. Um, Raul and, and, and America Mobile kept talking with us and we were going back and forth. And then eventually we came to this idea of starting a, communi a community around the enterprise neurosystem. That was really the idea. And mm. what we began to notice is that there were all these just disparate and separated AI models going into production and in all these different business units, but they weren't tied together in a central intelligence. And so we proposed to Raul and spoke to him about you know, where this could go. And he agreed. And we began to have a very creative conversation. And then um, we decided to start a community around it that brings in different partners. And we all work together in an open source way to, to basically determine what this overarching architecture could look like to unify artificial intelligence in a single instance across multiple business divisions. And it's a very natural wheelhouse for Red Hat to be in because we have Red Hat middleware. We have the Open Data Hub. We've been involved in these connective and um, complementary platforms for many, many years. That's our bread and butter. And then America Mobile, of course, has an expert. <laughs> they have a black belt in the, you know, the neurology of the mobile network. I mean, think about it. A mobile network itself is a giant neural system. Anyway, we've been looking at all that and how we can basically develop it out and what the best practices would be and the best way to go about it. So it's been a very exciting, uh, very exciting time. So it's actually quite interesting because everything that you just said, you have not used one very interesting word, which I keep hearing in other places, the notion of a smart, a smart network, a smart car, a smart energy or smart city or something like that. So do you think this enterprise neural network, uh, neural system and America Mobile has an element of smart? And if there is, what would that smart look? How would one, I guess, start by defining what smart means? Or what is the minimum expectation of when something is labeled as smart? It would really, and, and I know we're running into time here, but I, I guess, you know, I, I could go on for 30 minutes about this. But, <laughs> yeah. but in, in a nutshell, it is exactly what we were talking about earlier. It is, it was, it is um, a representation of a neurology or a neurosystem, very similar to the human neurosystem. And you have different forms of input coming in through different forms of detection. Like you have with the human body, visual sense, and you have touch, and you have being able to detect heat and cold and things like that. In the same manner, this enterprise neurology can detect different events all over the business. And it begins to feed it back, feed back in and correlate all these events 
you know, in a centralized intelligence, which is, oh, things are cold. Oh, I feel wind on my face. Oh, there's some I'm getting a couple of raindrops on my head. There must be a rainstorm coming in. I'll go back inside and get my raincoat coat. It's taking all those different information points and drawing them together in a correlation that leads to a new action and something that helps the system. And so really it's a very similar concept because you know things that seemingly are very separate actually can impact each other within the totality of a single business. And so it's how do you draw that together? You know, business intelligence has tried to do that with historical data for many years and somewhat with real time, but this is more of like an active neurology, you know, something mm -hmm. that can act and react autonomously, but also give recommendations to the C-suite. That's the idea. So if you were to be you know, brave enough to perhaps uh, predict where all of this would be in, say, 2025, what would you like to wish for that will be there? Be careful what you wish for, it might come true. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, there's been a notion, I, I've read other journals that have talked about autonomous companies that just kind of run themselves. I've heard about, uh, you know, a lot of different concepts used, and I, I don't ever think that's going to, I mean, my own suspicion is that won't be fully the case because, again, humans and machines networked together in unison are much more powerful than either one alone. And so to me, it's really, again, it's the way these assistants will integrate into our lives and help us in understanding and correlating all this data. I think it's going to come together in something like that. It'll be um, very symbiotic. It'll, I mean, the two will leverage each other because humans, have, I mean, we're the original, you know, neural net. I mean, or, or at least, you know, or <laughs> in the state of nature, there are many different neural nets, but yes, know, we're, yeah. what we're building and, and what we're emulating, it is the, it's kind of the founding area that we based it on. And so, um, and, and, you know, in biology in general, but what's interesting to me is I think it's going to be the combination of how those two will be brought together in a way that's very complementary. You know, I think that's going to be a real advance because it's not just the technology itself it's how do humans and the technology interact and the closer those are brought together the more effective this paradigm is going to be you know as you said it's all about biology and it's all about nature and, and so on so i mean i look at the nature itself i mean looking at uh, like dolphins for example or the uh, the mushroom uh, ecosystem you know they have neural networks themselves we don't understand a lot of what they do but I'm just curious as to what is it that we could, even though AI is software driven, there are parts of AI we cannot quite explain yet. And we cannot quite explain what a dolphin does and how a dolphin thinks, if you don't know that, how does a, a parrot think and does what it does? And how do mushrooms uh, you know, communicate with each other? Uh, some of you understand, some of you we don't. So we, we are actually in a very interesting uh, you know, position to figure out how to tap into these various networks as well, I would say. I think you're right. Yeah, I think we uh, underestimate other forms in nature and under underestimate other um, beings in nature. You know what I mean? My, yeah. my dog has taught me more about <laughs> She is absolutely highly intelligent, highly sensitive, uh, has a yeah. heart, all those things. And, you know, just because we can't communicate doesn't mean that we're, or just because she doesn't have opposable thumbs and can't, you know, yeah, build yeah. Us, it doesn't mean that we aren't very much alike. You know what I mean? There, there are so mm. many similarities there. And if we just try to look at things through a more open mind, I think we'll find commonality with other species that we already have. And we're all part of the same ecosystem or ecosphere. We could be part of the same organism and we don't know it. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's really yeah, so I mean, we're very small in the scheme of things. We have to be humble, you know, and keep an open mind as to what this architecture could ultimately look like, and and to borrow from the best. You know, it may not be, <laughs> may not, not be us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> never know. <laughs> so. We never know. Let, let me just uh, round up with one more question for you, and you know, this is a something that I've always grappled with as well. How do we handle ethics in AI? Ethics is a very uh, human-defined thought process and, and so on. How can we expect uh, an AI system to be ethical in the way that humans can understand? Do you have a sense of where that could, could be coming from, perhaps? I tend to be very balanced in the way I look at things. You know, there, there are military systems being created right now where 
you know, there may well be an AI arms race already well underway. And then you look at other areas where, like, in terms of how humans interact with the global ecology, you know, the, the global environment, and how we can improve and optimize our impact on the environment and allow other species to really thrive and to create some harmony there. You know, there are a lot of different negative and positive uses of all of this. And, you know, I, I think it's just going to end up down the middle, just like it would in humanity. It'll be reflective yeah. of humanity. There will be bad actors. There will be good actors. There will be, you know, the folks like Gandhi who emerge, you know, from an AI perspective and use cases. There will be things like, you, you know what I mean? I, I don't want to get too esoteric, but I think sure, it's, sure, I understand. Yeah. It's, just, it's just great achievement in terms of the beneficial uses of AI and then some negative achievements as well. And it's how do we how do we navigate that as we go forward? I mean, it's it will be reflective of humanity, and we have to come up with ethical guidelines in terms of in terms of common day to day usages of AI. I think all of that has to be determined within a standards body with every country that has its own AI subsystems. It's it is something that will have to be regulated at a certain level, I think, and there there should be remedial programs for some of those breaches yeah. as well. How do you deal with that? So I think it's, how do we look at all that? You know, how, how do we, yeah. we just look at it through the lens of humanity because that is the lens we have. That's, yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, thank you, Bill. I think that's been a fascinating uh, half hour for us to chat on. You know, if you have any final thoughts that you want to, you know, do to round off this conversation. <laughs> it's more, uh, it's just an exciting time to be at Red Hat, to be working on this uh, kind of AI infrastructure stuff. It's absolutely highly creative and it's been wonderful working with all of our partners on this endeavor and uh, America Mobile and go down the list. Everybody's been fantastic. So yeah, we've um, we've had a really fun experience pulling all this together and uh, plan to continue it. All right, excellent. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for the, the chat. And you just uh, heard from uh, Bill Wright who has been, who's with the Red Hat's uh, AI strategy for uh, global industries. And with that, I will say thank you very much, and uh, we will catch you at the next podcast. Take care. Bye-bye.